Ah, a visitor. Welcome, welcome. May I ask your name? It's a sincere pleasure to meet you. Tell me, what brings you all the way down here? Ah, Kabash. I know this man. He came through here some weeks ago. I will tell you everything I know, but first, a request. I have been living down here alone for many years, with nobody to talk to but myself. The one thing I long for above all else before I die is a good philosophical argument with somebody astute. I'm hoping that person is you. Let us find out with this simple question. Have you deduced the name of the god responsible for the Golden Rule? Excellent. I see you are indeed quite astute. Very few come to that realization before their time in the sun is over. Now, will you join me in a friendly Socratic dialogue? Good enough for me. Now, let me begin with a question. Would you say you know the difference between right and wrong? I see. Then a word of advice. If you do not want to get yourself and everyone else in this place killed, it is best that you start thinking about it. And soon. You see, out there in the world, being uncertain about right and wrong was acceptable, because our mistakes rarely had consequences. So we would tell lies and bend rules, and turn a blind eye and rationalize, and yet still find a way to think of ourselves as good people. But under the golden rule, morality matters. The slightest wrongdoing could result in a mass execution. So to navigate this maze, we would have to be certain about the difference between right and wrong. Wouldn't you agree? That is an excellent question, and it leads directly to my next line of inquiry. So let me ask you this. Is there one system of morality which is always perfectly correct, which you could follow in every situation and always do the right thing? How can that be? Since they all have differences, it follows that in some cases they would offer different conclusions about what is right and wrong. If there is a correct moral code, then wouldn't it follow that only one can be the correct one? Ah, you know, I think you'd find an ally in Herodotus, a scribe from among my people who lived some 400 years ago. He told the story of a man named Darius, whose curiosity was piqued when he learned that a certain tribe had the practice of eating their dead. He asked some Greeks who burnt their dead, what would it take for you to eat your dead? Aghast, they replied, nothing. Then he asked the tribe who ate their dead, what would it take for you to burn your dead? Nothing, they replied, equally aghast. From this, Herodotus concluded that custom is king, that right and wrong are merely local ideas which do not survive the journey from one tribe to another. I take it you're in agreement? Then let me ask you this. If you visited a tribe where they ate each other, copulated with the dead and drank wine from cups made out of human skulls, would you still maintain that within such a tribe there is nothing wrong with such conduct? And that's a credit to you. It is the mark of a civilized person to change their position when presented with a superior argument. My point is this. I don't think anyone alive truly knows any hard and fast rules about right and wrong. Surely you would agree there are circumstances where an exception may be made such as where it is necessary for self-defense or to prevent a greater evil? 
For any rule you can imagine, there are countless situations in which that rule may be suspended. And those situations are impossible to codify. If there is one thing I have observed about rules, it is that virtuous people do not need them, and evil people will always find a way around them. And so we must accept our limitations, and the sad truth that no human society will ever achieve the utopia for which it strives. In mathematics, we would call it an asymptote, a line that can be approached but never reached. Because the only way to create a utopia is with the ever-present threat of force, such as the golden rule. This and no other is the root from which a tyrant springs when he first appears as a protector. And life under tyranny is no utopia at all. Well, reasonable minds may differ. And if Utopia really is possible, then I would be glad to be wrong. In any case, thank you for humoring an old man. I would be happy to answer your questions. You mean, how did I end up living alone in this cave with nothing but these relics of the past for company? It's a long story. I was a quarrelsome young man. At 19, I left Corinth for Rome to study rhetoric at one of her finest academies, so I could argue more forcefully. Back then I used to enjoy verbally sparring with everyone I could, and I was good. One night I found myself in a tavern, in an argument with a drunken mercenary. It became heated, he drew a gladius, and I won the argument, but lost my life. I woke up on the banks of the Styx at a campfire opposite Karen. Of course, I tried to persuade her to let me return, but even with all my skill, I failed. I settled in, made friends, and learned what I could, quickly realizing our little community faced certain death under the Golden Rule. So I began looking for a place to hide underground. Fortunately, I found this place waiting for me. You see, I was not the first to take refuge here. I returned to my friends above, persuaded them to join me, and twelve of us descended for the last time to live out our days hidden from Hades' tyranny. They are one and the same. The Romans call him Pluto, but long before that, my people called him Hades. My generation was wiped out, turned to gold, many years ago. My friends and I were able to avoid the same fate by hiding down here. I think it's safest to assume that if I was to return, Hades would realize that his furies hadn't finished the job, and he'd send them after me again. I fear that if you were to utter my name in the city, even by mistake, that Hades would hear you and know I am still alive. I'm afraid I am the only one left. There were 12 of us in the beginning, but one by one, my friends passed away. Some from malnutrition, others from madness and despair. It has been lonely. Before my unexpected visit from Kabash some weeks ago, I had not seen another person in many, many years. Living in darkness is not without its challenges. The first challenge is diet. Fortunately, I found that eating fresh fish provides most of the nutrients I need. And sometimes, when there are Greek people living up above, I surface at night and salvage the offerings they've left in the temple of Demeter. The greater challenge is the isolation. So I like to imagine arguments, where I argue both sides. But, like so many things in life, arguments are better with a partner. As you wish. Ha! Huh. If I did, would I be living like this? Did we not discuss it at length already? Oh, I see. You're toying with me. Ha! Huh. You seek the plaque bearing the Egyptian inscription. 
It is a cursed object, and I would be happy to give it to you if Kabash had not already taken it. I will tell you, but you may find him hostile. To prepare for your encounter, there are certain things you must know. Very few know this, but before the Romans came to this city, it was once entirely Greek. The architecture, the temples, and the people. When the Romans came, in typical fashion, they claimed it as their own, built over everything that could be built over, and renamed the things that could not. Thus, the shrine of Persephone became the shrine of Proserpina. And when they found an obelisk bearing the name Hades, they tore it off and replaced it with Pluto instead. And the city's dwindling Greek residents, witnessing this compulsive Roman conquest, decided to preserve what they could of their heritage. They gathered their art and valuables, secreted them away through the temple of Demeter, and hid them here, out of reach of the Romans. However, there was one thing that always seemed out of place to me, and it is the very thing you seek. An even older plaque bearing an Egyptian inscription. We had no idea until years later, when the first of my friends began to die. As a result of their deaths, we began to dig catacombs branching off from this cavern to lay them to rest. We extended the tunnel so far that we accidentally discovered another, an even older tunnel, which somebody had gone to great lengths to keep hidden. Suddenly it made sense why there was an out-of-place Egyptian plaque among our people's possessions. You see, we proud Greeks had thought the Romans beasts for stealing and corrupting our heritage. But it turns out this game has been going on much longer than any of us imagined. I think it is best you head through the catacombs and follow Kabash's trail. There are certain things you must see for yourself. Take this key, you'll need it to open the gate. I enjoyed our chat, but please, keep my presence here a secret, yes.
Stop! Do not come any closer. Who are you? I am Kabash. Hmm. And let me guess. Another Greek or Roman come to loot and plunder the resting place of my ancestors, hmm? Hmm. Trousers, boots, curious here. No, I suppose you do not. Then what do you want? Hmm, to what end? Hmm, that is welcome news. You really are not Greek or Roman, are you? I was planning to return it myself, but for now, I must remain. Here, take it and restore the honor of Osiris. Now, as for the other plaque. Indeed, I have it right here. I stumbled across a collection of dusty curiosities while searching for a place to hide from the hungry children of Amit, and there it was. You may not. In fact, I am about to destroy it. Because it speaks a treacherous, blasphemous lie. I will tell you, but first, do you know what this place is? Indeed, and I see you know our history. This is the Duat. See what has become of it. I have been down here for weeks, piecing together its story, and here is what I have learned. As Egypt declined and the Greeks had their turn to flourish, their souls came here in great numbers, but instead of adopting our ways, they copied and corrupted them. When they found the obelisk bearing the name Osiris, the true god of the underworld, they desecrated it, removing his name and replacing it with <sighs> Hades. Even the ferryman of the dead, known to my people long before as Kerti, they renamed to Keron. As if that desecration was not enough, they built over this place using it as the foundation for their own underworld, so that ours was forgotten. Hmm, <laughs> my only solace is that the Greeks then suffered the same fate when the Romans rose to power, renaming Hades to Pluto, and the cycle began anew. I am glad to hear it, which brings me to this other, fourth plaque. It is inscribed with a script I do not recognize, but it is ancient, 
almost as if it is older than the plaque bearing Osiris's name. But if that is so, it would imply the gods of Egypt are mere imitations too, copied and corrupted from an ancient people who prospered even before us, and that my people did to them what the Greeks and Romans did to us. But this I cannot accept. I sense a deception. Perhaps it is the work of Set the Usurper, seeking to undermine Osiris once more. You will never know. This work of sacrilege must be destroyed, thrown into the black abyss below in Osiris' name. You are too late. It is done. You would plunge into the depths of the Duat with no way back up. Madness. If it will help you to see reason, then ask. I am from Rakotis, which you may know as Alexandria, the name of the city the Greeks built over it. I was a fisherman, like my father before me. Since the Romans had taken over from the Greeks, I took the opportunity to learn Latin and eventually traveled to Rome. When the fires broke out last year, I tried to help. I gathered terrified locals into my boat and led many of them to safety farther along the Tiber. On my seventh trip, a passenger demanded I wait for his brother. But we were full to almost sinking, and smoke was all around us. I told him his brother would have to save himself, and he tried to bribe me by placing a coin into my hand. When I refused, he drew a dagger and thrust it between my ribs. I awoke on the banks of the river to a stranger wearing a ram headdress. He said his name was Kirti, and at the time I simply thought him odd. It did not dawn on me until much later that he was THE Kirti, the ram-headed ferryman described in the Book of the Dead. This is where I belong, as caretaker of the memories of my people. If our ways are to be remembered, it falls to me. I think if someone is to break the golden rule, it will not be me, for I try to live as I always have by the command of the goddess Ma'at. Do to the doer to make him do. As for the punishment that will come from it, I finally understand why it has long been said among my people that gold is the skin of the gods. I do not know what could possibly lie beneath the underworld. Perhaps it is infinite darkness. Perhaps it is the lair of Amit, the devourer of souls. All I know is it would be unwise to venture down there. Most unwise. Good. Be gone from this place. Wait. You are planning to go down there. I see it in your eyes. You would plunge into the depths of the Duat with no way back up. Madness. Hmm. We shall see.
when I told you that you would not find a way back up, that was not a prediction. That was a promise. You will die here. I disagree. I warned you against coming down here, against perpetuating this sacrilege. But you persisted. You have undermined and dishonored the true god of the underworld. How did you think this would end, if not with bloodshed? Very well, I will listen. But if I sense deception, or if you further insult my gods, I will carry out my threat. So tell me, why should I let you live after you salvaged this instrument of blasphemy? Why? To what end? But why? What business could you have with Osiris? Doubtful. What do you know about honoring the Lord of Silence? Hmm. You speak the truth. Indeed. It seems we have all been deceived. Many of my ancestors endured great hardship to live good lives so that we may descend to the Duat in death and be judged accordingly. We prepare to have our hearts weighed on Anubis's scales and to swear ourselves innocent of sin before the 42 assessors of Ma'at. And yet, I arrive here to find the Book of the Dead contained only a seed of truth. And now, I ask myself, did our priests steal and embellish the stories of an older people and feed us lies all our lives simply to trick us into obedience? I am not sure I follow. Speak plainly. Now you insult me and all of my ancestors. You have sealed your own fate. Ha, good. I welcome it. You see, the philosopher told me that each time it breaks, Osiris bellows with rage, and his voice shakes the very foundations of the earth. I can only hope one more tremor will lay waste to this fragile place once and for all, and you along with it. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one.
Salve, friend. Mind telling me who you are and what you're doing with that bow on your back? Oh, that sounds serious. I'm listening. All right, let me see. Stop Fabia going in, but send the new arrival to the empty shrine. Understood. Yulia? Oh no. All right, I can do that. Oh, poor guy. My uncle was a victim at rheumatism's altar, and he ended up killing himself. All right, got it. I'll go, but once I'm done, I'll need you to tell me how you know all of this. You're here. I'm so glad you decided to visit. I'm Aurelia, and uh, I hope I'm not being too forward, but the moment I laid eyes on you, I was intrigued. There's a light in your eyes I've never seen before. A certain learning and sophistication. Oh, I see. You prefer the company of men. Maybe you should go and make friends you with Virgil instead. Attack or pursue I take the back what I said. That always Suddenly, returns. I don't find you so intriguing anymore. Let's just forget that ever happened, so we can at least do business. So, what brings you to my tavern? All right, see ya. And may Vesta watch over you. I'm Equitia. To what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? See you again soon, I hope. to have been elected your magistrate. Magistrate, yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I do thank you. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be in here. Talk. What business could you possibly have with me? An intriguing proposition. Go on. Hmm. Perhaps you're not as silly as those clothes make you look. What makes you say that? You know, I may have the very thing you're looking for. Some time ago, when he still cared for me, he wrote me a love letter. Only, he used the wrong name. Now, Addressing one's wife by the wrong name is not unheard of among philandering Romans. But in this case, the name he got wrong was his own. I confronted him about it, and he stammered through some incoherent response. I let it go, eventually, and yet... questions have lingered in the back of my mind ever since. But... wait a minute. Why exactly are you helping me? Oh, aren't you charming? I'm quite sure my husband would see with impotent rage if he overheard you say that. I love it. 
It seems our interests are aligned. I imagine knowing his true identity will give me the leverage I need to manage him appropriately. But first, I need you to do something for me. I want you to bring me some wine. Just one small urn should do it. Oh, don't look at me like that. I know this must be hard for you to wrap your sweet little pleb head around. So what do you need me to spell out? Let me tell you something about Maliolus. He talks a lot about freedom, but what he doesn't tell you is that he means freedom for men. After all I've done for him, counselling him through his entire election campaign, and he had the audacity to lock me in here. He said it was for my own good, and that my drinking was unbecoming of a lady, let alone the wife of a magistrate. I'll show him unbecoming. Tonight, at his victory party, I'm going to get good and merry, and if he tries to discipline me again, I'll threaten to expose his true identity in front of everyone. I am so looking forward to it. You mean, aside from the fact that I'm locked in this room and Domitius is right outside the villa, because there's barely any left in the city. In fact, there's only one small urn, as far as I'm aware. And getting it won't be easy. So you'll help me. Excellent. Now, you'll need to pay a visit to that strumpet Aurelia in her tavern. I expect you'll have to flatter her a bit. If that doesn't work, you might be able to get some advice from Yulia, who's probably still at the shrine of Apollo. I heard they used to be close. They both appreciate the poetry of Sappho of Lesbos if you get my meaning. Thank you. Sorry, I'm still a bit out of it. Galerius just saved my life. Was there something you wanted? Lucretia says I'm supposed to rest. Our priestess at Quetia once told me it's the god's way of creating a city without sin. But if that's the case, then whichever god is responsible for it didn't think it through. I mean, all it really does is make bad people better at hiding their sins. And good people too frightened to stand up for themselves. I've seen Maliolus, Claudia and Domitius make grown men cry. Romans. They don't cry easily. They've never physically hurt anyone. But the point is, they don't have to. They've got people running scared because everyone knows Maliolus is the favorite to win today's election. Really? Then I hope fortune smiles on you, friend. All right. Goodbye. Hmm. A golden bowl, just like Apollo and Diana. Cerberus lifts his triple head and lets out his threefold praying. Livia, 
Would you stop muttering like Madeira over a cauldron? You'll scare away my customers. They follow their trades, imitating their previous lives, but they are ignorant. This again. You're in a world of your own, aren't you? Back again. Couldn't stay away, huh? I do, but I'm afraid it's not for sale. It's the last jug in the entire city, so I'm saving it for a... a romantic occasion. Really? That's your move? Honey, I'll admit I was intrigued by you at first, but then you had to go and open your mouth. Unfortunately for you, nobody gets a second chance at a first impression. What's that supposed to be? The riddle of the Sphinx? All right, see ya. and Diana's. Oh, it's you again. Is everything all right? Really? You're going to give that snake a taste of her own medicine? I'm in. What do you need? Ah, so you need to sweep her off her feet, then. Is that it? I think I can help you with that. As much as it disgusts me to say this, we were sort of involved before she betrayed me. So I know her better than anyone. The thing you need to know about her is this. She's obsessed with money. An ostentatious display of wealth probably wouldn't hurt. One more thing, and I feel dirty saying this. She keeps a journal upstairs in her room, beside her bed. If you could somehow take a look, that might tell you how she thinks. May Nemesis guide you. All right. Goodbye. Hmm. A golden bowl. Just like oh, shiny. Hello there, friend. May I say, that is a glorious bow you're carrying. Do you mind if I ask where you acquired it? Well, I'll take your word for it. But perhaps you'd be interested in selling it to me. I mean, it's not as if you have any use for it down here. Now you're talking, I'm interested. How about a hundred denarii? Oh, that's a little excessive, don't you think? It's not the bow of Ulysses we're talking about. All right, all right. But I'm going to need you to tell me before I pay up. Wait, wait, wait. Let's not be too hasty, friend. I just want a little assurance that I can trust you, that's all. Hmm, I suppose you're right. All right, you drive a hard bargain, but here's your money. Now, the location of that bow. Uh, what? But I already knew that, you imbecile. Everyone knows that. I can't take that golden bow because stealing from the goddess in her own shrine would break the golden rule. You promised to tell me where I could get one of my own. What is this? Some kind of joke? I... I don't believe this is happening. Don't even talk to me. Oh, shiny.
handsome. Back again. Couldn't stay away, huh? I do, but I'm afraid it's not for sale. It's the last jug in the entire city, so I'm saving it for a... a romantic occasion. Everything, except this. Sorry, sweetheart. Good idea. You had your one and only chance and you blew it. Time to move on. Certainly, for ten denarii. Have you met Livia? She used to do my hair, until one day she just snapped. This place has that effect on people. Now, she just stands around, caked in filth, muttering nonsense to herself. It's a real shame. Now I have to do my own hair. Whatever you like. You know, normally, I'd expect you to buy me a drink before asking if I want to get out of here. Straight to business, huh? I can work with that. As a matter of fact, I do know a way out. I'm happy to tell you all about it, but this is valuable information we're talking about, and I don't just give it out like some cheap oracle. So, how badly do you want it? Is it worth, say, a thousand denarii to you? tell you too much, or you'd figure it out for yourself. But I promise you, you'll never have to spend another hour in this city ever again. Ha! It's hardly my fault if people misunderstand the terms of a deal. I mean, it does say, let the buyer beware, right outside my tavern. All right, see ya. You stay away from my money! The many shall suffer for the sins of the one.